So good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's talk. Um, tonight's speaker is uh, Ewan McPherson, who needs little introduction to those of you who have known the work of the clan and the museum over the years. So Ewan has spent uh, decades working tirelessly for both the Clan McPherson Association and the Clan McPherson Museum, including being both chairman of uh, the association and convener of the museum. Uh, Ewan has been responsible for the exhibition at the museum for the best part of the last 20 years, until very recently, um, and was also the driving force behind the construction of the splendid Memorial Cairn to Ewan of the 45 um, at Glentrium, a wonderful Clan Macpherson site for which we have uh, Ewan to thank. Um, this evening, though, is going to be something a little different, a humorous harmonic interlude, as uh, Ewan has titled it, in which Ewan will be playing the harmonica, but also telling us a wee bit about his work at the museum and relating it to Clan Macpherson history, and giving us a taste of Ewan's contributions to Clan Cayley's at the annual gatherings in Newtonmore over the years. We have a, over the years, we have a virtual representation of that tonight. So I'll bring up the PowerPoint, Ewan, and then over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And just to say, I won't be saying too much about the museum at all, Jim. I'll be concentrating mainly on the, the, the musical side. So that's okay. And I'll, I'll make a start with the tune. I think that's the best way to to settle everyone down if you're not settled down already and see if you recognize this one. Thank you. That, um, that's a tune called The Waters of Carlskew, and it comes from a, a little place, a tiny little place up in the county of Sutherland on the west coast. A delightful, a delightful place with one of the most amazing bridges in the world, one of the most scenic bridges in the world. It's won many awards for its design and well worth a visit. Um, so that was just a little opening. I'd like to give you some background to um, to, um, and I'm just going to ask Elsa if she can turn down her volume, in, in, because I, I fear there might be an echo coming back. I'm going to start with the, the origins of the um, harmonica. It dates back to at least the third century BC, but possibly before the, the, the Chinese have claim that goes back to 1800 BC, but there's to some carved bones that were found, but there's, uh, that's disputed due to the excavation techniques and the lack of contemporary drawings. Now, the instrument that, one of the instruments is descended from is the Jew's harp and often called the Jaws harp. The, the latter name, the Jaws harp is probably more correct because you play it with your jaw. And why I got the name the Jews harp, I really don't know. Now, I used to be able to play it, and I don't play it now due to um, an accident, not an accident, a deliberate Glasgow kiss I was given many years ago. If, if anyone doesn't know what a Glasgow kiss is, then look it up later on. But these two front teeth, um, the one, this one was knocked out, and the one next to it, was loose but tightened up and it's dead and there's a big split down the middle and I'll show you my lovely teeth. And I've got the bridges down there as well from another incident so I've got to be very careful with these teeth, particularly this front one because it's a new one, a new crown 
and it costs me a lot of money, so I don't want the vibration to knock it out. <laughs> and that's what can happen, believe me. I even have to be careful with my electric um, electric toothbrush because it, it vibrates. But I'll, I'll, I'll gently try it. I'm only making a very slight noise and that's quite deliberate because I can actually feel it hitting the tooth because you actually grip it with your teeth and your front teeth and your lips and you breathe and that's how you breathe in and breathe out and purse your lips and your tongue that makes the different noises but it's very difficult to get a proper tune out of it and the second the second um instrument that's related to is a shung, it's pronounced shung, and that's the next slide, Jim, please. This is a chap, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Kuo Wai, and that was taken a good few years ago on the banks of the River Thames. I got it off of YouTube, but I, I know that he still plays around there, and, and also in Chinatown, off Co Covent Garden in London. I've seen him playing. And the, the shung is that instrument you can see below, and that's made. With, I think it's um, just trying to remember how many how many um, vertical reeds. It's something like twenty vertical reeds that that he plays, and he and he blows in the, the mouthpiece at the bottom. It looks like a cup holding the reeds. So it's descended from that, um, and also the accordion, the concertina, the harmonium and all other free read instruments working on the same principle. I right, thank you, Jim. And we'll have the next slide. This is uh, Christian Friedrich Ludwig Buschmann, who is uh, a young German instrument maker. Sorry, yes, him. Um, in about 1821, he was only 16 years old. And I should have said the Sheng arrived in Europe, or the Shung arrived in Europe around about 1740s. Anyway, Bushman is credited with inventing the harmonica and also with the accordion. They work on the same principle. Um, he created a horizontal instrument. That was the first horizontal. Well, the other one you saw, the Shung, was, was um, uh, vertical. And it has 20, 21 free read reads that he used. There isn't an example of it, afraid of, that I can show you, and I don't know if one exists or whether they've all disappeared. And he fastened these to a wooden block in such a way that it was possible to blow them individually. And he called the instrument the aura. And this instrument became popular at that time, but it could only blow, um, it, you, it could only provide blow notes. In other words, you could only blow into it. Whereas today's harmonica, you, you can suck and blow, or as I say in Scotland, you can suck or you can blow. And then moving on into 1825, Joseph Richter, who was, the, uh, who was from the former Czechoslovakian region of Bohemia, invented an instrument which has become the modern harmonica. This instrument had 10 holes, and I'll show you something similar in a few minutes. The two reed plates, each with 10 metal reeds. This meant that each hole had two reeds, one which sounded when blowing and the other which sounded when breathing in, soaking and blowing. So that was the first instrument of its type at that time. At the same, it's the same as the current diatonic harmonica, which I'll show you an example of. Richter relocated to Bavaria in Germany and mass production began about 1829. And can I say that the Richter scale has nothing at all to do with this um, Joseph Richter, that was Charles Richter, not to be confused, which was about measuring earthquakes. And he was a bit earlier actually, and American, not German. It, was, it has also been suggested that the um, Benjamin Franklin, one of the founding fathers of the US, invented it in 1761, but I'm fairly confident this was, was not the case because he invented something called the harmonica, beginning with an A, not with a H for hotel. 
uh, and that was a, a glass harmonic, and that was a number of glasses slotted into each other, laid out, and I think it was something made of wood. And then he would wet his hand and rub his hands along the top of the glass, nothing to do with soaking a blonde. And, and so I, I think that's a mistake to even try and attribute it to him. And um, another one, another one who's been, it said, uh, invented it, is Char Sir Charles Wheatstone, who invented the English concertina in 1822, 1823. But both of these are most unlikely as far as I'm concerned. And I think the, the proper inventor was Joseph Richter. Then we move on to the next slide, Jim, please. In 1857, now a famous chap, he wasn't then, he was a German clockmaker, Matthias Hornell, I think Matthias is Matthew, um, began crafting harmonicas in Trossingen, assisted by his wife and a single employee um, in 1857. There were 650 were made in the first year and they were all made by hand at that time, there was no way of engineering them. So they were all made by hand. So it took a fair bit of time for the three of them to do that. He was a shrewd, a very shrewd businessman. He bought out his competitors, exported abroad, including to the USA. And by 1900, he had handed the business over to his five sons. And by that time, the company had grown to produce over 4 million harmonicas each year. I was, I was employing many, many workers. Subsequently, in the, in the 1920s, Horner began manufacturing chromatic harmonicas, which, unlike the diatonic form, can be played in any key. And I'll, I'll show you an example of that in a minute. And the Horner Company, I'm pleased to say, still continues to this day. And bear in mind, they're now getting a lot of competition from the Chinese. For example, one of my best um, harmonicas I pay up to £100 for, which isn't very often because it lasts me a long time. Excellent quality, made of wood, pear wood, sometimes maple wood, but I think most of owners are, are pear wood. A good quality metal, and the Chinese are now producing them for as, as little as £10, but made of plastic and not nearly the same quality. Okay for a beginner to learn on, I would hasten to add, but not good if you want to play it to a reasonable standard. Anyway, I'm now moving on to um, the next slide, Jim, please. This is how, basically how a harmonica is made up. It's made up with the cone and the two metal reed plates. Okay, Jim, I'm going to show the real thing now. Thank you, if you can take this slide away. This this is the um, this this is a real harmonica. It's actually a Chinese one. There was a reason for buying it. In two thousand and six, uh, I was asked to join a group for the Cayley, organised by Bruce, and and we were all given a piece of music. I think it was Caledonia it was a tune, but it was in the scale of B, and I didn't have an instrument for the scale of B, so I got this Chinese one, <laughs> and it does play adequately. As I say, not as good as a horner, of course. And, and I've also got one of these which I took apart. So you have the top and the bottom plates. Sorry, that way. Top and bottom plates, if you can see them. Can you see them? Thank you. And then, then that's one of the reed plate. The other reed plate goes on the other side. And that's, that's the plastic comb, which should really be a good quality wood, as I've said, and a reed plate. And all the reeds have holes all the way around. And, and in this case, the actual reeds are stapled. You can see the little staples, lots of staples on there to that. And they can be tuned. And there's various ways of tuning it. And one way, I, I don't need to tune mine, but I know there's one small instrument which I very seldom touch as I know not quite right. 
but you, you can actually twiddle about with it and and you can tune it but you can also buy the type of instrument you can use for tuning something like the guitar the, the guitar not the guitar um that um that tells you if you've got hitting the right note when you're tuning it it's a very useful instrument for doing it so that's That's one read going in, the other read going in, back and front, and then you simply put, and th th now these are screwed down with about, in this case, uh, 14 little screws on either side, tiny little screws that you can screw in, and then you put the top on, on both sides, of course, and you've got your instrument. So that's basically how simple a harmonica or mouth organ or muthi is. I should have said there are various names for it. There's also the, um, it's also called the French harp, the blues harp, pocket piano, Mississippi saxophone. And the one I use most, of course, is the muthi. Now, as I said, there are three main types of harmonica or muthi and this is a diatonic so this is a little one it can come slightly larger but it's usually about this size about 10 holes and the holes are actually numbered again it's a good instrument for if I can find the front a good instrument for learning to play on <laughs> It's not my favourite instrument, but it is for many people. Um, so if you want to play something, and this is in the key of C, which is probably the most popular key. I tend to play tunes in the key of G, if possible. But um, you, you, mo these little ones are mostly in the, the key of C or G. Then we come to the chromatic. Again, it's not my favourite instrument. This this particular instrument. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, and it's got the slider at the end. Very good for playing classical music or blues, being as I tend to play mostly folk music, um, I tend to go for the next one, the tremolo. And you slide this, and you can, the beauty of this one, this one costs for, for your information about 150 pounds it's a horn arm and it's called the larry adler professional 16. now that larry adler is probably the most famous harmonicus that's ever lived I, I, I would say and certainly the best um that i've ever seen and used to see a lot of them on television at one time never saw them in real life but um larry adler was born in um, baltimore in, in maryland uh, and he started, he was self-taught, never had a lesson, and he um, won lots of different competitions as a young lad. And he, he more or less turned professional at about the age of 16, but he was playing it from a younger age than that. And, um, and then during the war, he entertained the troops. I think that was basically his, his job at the time. And he'd made a trip to London before the war in the 1930s and it was a big hit here, a huge hit here. And he went back to the States and then after the war, he got caught up in the McCarthy era and, and was accused of being a communist. And um, he had an unsuccessful lawsuit. Anyway, he left America and came, to get, uh, came across to London where he, where he stayed actually for the rest of his life and had a most successful career playing the harmonica with philharmonic orchestras. He could play Beethoven. He, when he first met, met Gershwin, he played uh, the, his Rhapsody in blues. And, and Gershwin said that the tune had actually been made for him. It, it wasn't, but that, that was his opinion after he heard him play it. So you can see lots of um, 
uh, Larry Adler on YouTube, if you wish to do so. He, he, uh, he died in 2001, it was, and it was buried in, his ashes were buried in Golders Green Cemetery in North London. And I'll play a quick tune on this, as I say, it's not, not my preferred instrument, but it goes something like this. And when you watch Larry Adler, he gets very excited and bangs this at times and gets really emotive about how he's playing it. I tend to just tap it occasionally. But what you do with this, what this is doing is introducing the flats and the sharps where it's necessary. But if you're a bit clever, you can bend notes with it as well. The, the, the expression is bending notes. just to give you a flavour of it. Do have a, do have a watch of uh, Larry Adler on, on YouTube. And the last one, which is my preferred one, and I'll play this one. And I should explain that th th this is a, tr um, um, a Horner Harmonica song band, tremolo tuning. I, th I looked online yesterday, and, um, and you can pick a good one up for 25 to 35 pounds, second hand, of course, because these are all old instruments now. Um, the, the um, I can just a second, I can hear Elsa's. I'm hearing an echo from Elsa's, she's next door watching. Um, And th this one, as I said earlier, is mostly used in, in folk tunes. Now, I have the same instrument in the key of G, but with these you can get two keys on one, one either side, so you have 96 notes you can play on here. And each side has roughly three and a half um, octaves. So that there's a very good tonal range within it and now I've written and I'm going to play a little tune which I'm sure the Scots will recognize at least I hope they do <laughs> I hope they do Now that's a that's a lovely old tune that most Scots kids certainly used to get taught. It's called Coulter's Candy, and it was written by a chap called Robert Coulter in the eighteen seventies, I guess, maybe eighteen eighties. Um, and his right name was Robert Coulthart, and he lived in Gala Shields, and he was a weaver. But he also sold he also boiled sweeties, sweets, candy. And he used to sell it in the local market. And, and he wrote the words, and I think the music for it. And where ice cream vans, or maybe even fish and chip vans, now go around playing tunes from the vehicle, he stood outside with um, a penny whistle. And we'd play this tune that he made himself, Coulter's Candy. And the words go, Ali Bali, Ali Bali B, sitting on your mammy's knee. Greeting for another Bobby to buy mere Coulter's candy. Now, to, to um, interpret that for you, it's um, 
Barley, 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 barley bee is meaningless. Doesn't mean, doesn't actually mean anything. Sitting on your mammy's knee is sitting on your, your mother's knee. Greeting for another bobby, that means crying from an old Scots sixpence to, to buy more of Coulter's candy. So that, that's the interpretation for him. And it's a lovely old Scots border tune. It's not a Highland tune. So I'm now moving on to a different instrument this time. Um, not, not yet, Jim. Sorry, it's in. For those of, those of you who were at the gathering a, a couple of years ago, am I on the big screen, Jim? Thank you. Sorry, I wasn't sure because all I can see in myself is in the little screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I played this. I got this instrument from Rouge actually, actually, but I've, I've had one in the past. It's, it's a, a horner. Rouge is a curator, museum curator, and he and Kate picked it up somewhere, and it comes in that box. Then inside that box is this, is written this. I can now put that because I couldn't do that before. I, I wasn't sure if I was on the big screen or not. And and then you open that up, and inside is the smallest harmonica in the world. There's lots of them, incidentally. It's not just this one. It's got a horn on one side. Sorry, one side. And if I got it the right way up, little lady on the other side. And it's got eight notes. And if you were at the clan, Kaylee, I think it was two years ago, I actually played it, and I'm going to tell the same story that I told them about this instrument. And then I don't know, Elsa and Donna and John and Iris certainly there that I can that I can see. Um, so I'll, I'll tell the same story about this this little magic instrument. You can put the next slide up, Jim, please. Slide five. There we are. This was a crew of Gemini 6, um, crewed by Tom Stafford, who you can see in it, got the names up there, and Wally Shearer. Wally Shearer. And it was due to launch on October the 25th, but that launch was aborted for some reason. And meanwhile, Gemini 7 took off, was launched on December the 4th. And their second, the second launch um, of Gemini 6 took place on December the 15th. I think they actually renamed it Gemini 6A. But anyway, I'll call it Gemini 6. And, and it took off. And, and Gemini was the, um, that followed the program Mercury and was the first time that there was a double crew. I should have, should have said that. Prior to that, it had just been single manned. And it was the first time in history that two vehicles maneuvered to meet each other. So the two Gemini 6 and 7 met in space. And, and the picture on the bottom, that's one picture is of Gemini 6 taking off. I think that's a successful one, obviously. And on the right is a, a picture of Gemini 7 taken from Gemini 6 in space. I, I think it's absolutely remarkable how close they are. Within a foot of each other in all that distance out in space. And, and they flew in formation like that for about five hours. Then just before Gemini 6 was set to re-enter Earth's, Earth's atmosphere on December the 16th, Tom Stafford made a radio transmission to um, Mission Control. And he said, and you can actually hear this online, uh, we have an object. It's a very blurred um, sound. We have an object. Looks like a satellite going from north to south up in polar orbit. He's in a very low trajectory, traveling from north to south, and has a very high climbing ratio. It looks like it might even be, um, and he hesitates, it's very low. Looks like he might be going to re-enter soon. Stand by one. You might just let me try to pick up that thing. At that, pound, at that point, this, this tiny sound was heard. So went on. 
that they played jingle bells. I hope, I hope that came through all right. Um, and they they successfully landed afterwards. They made they made, they made their way back shortly after that. And on, on arrival, um, I should have said Stafford jingled the bells, some bells. And I think we can look at the, the next slide now, Jim, please. On arrival back, um, Stafford told the Smithsonian Magazine for a 2005 article, he could play the harmonica, that, sorry, that, um, that Wally could play the harmonica and we practiced two or three times before we took off. But of course, we didn't tell the guys on the ground. We never considered singing since I couldn't carry a tune in a bushel basket. The harmonica shown to the press upon the return was a Horner little lady. The two astronauts had prepared for the performance by secretly attaching dental floss, that's what that is, on, the, on this little instrument, there's a tiny little, a tiny little hook. I think you can just see it now. A, a tiny little hook on the end of it um, that he put the um, dental floss through, uh, dental floss and Velcro to both instruments and hung them on the, the wall of the spa spacecraft. They secreted them there when no one was looking. And Stafford and Shearer donated the instruments to the um, Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. in 1967 and are on display in the Apollo to the Moon exhibition. Now, in 1994, Colonel Rod Clark, formerly of the U.S. Air Force, that's the late Rod, gave Margaret and the, uh, and the late great Jay Donald and Betty McPherson from Oakville, Ontario, a tour of the museum. Uh, Jay Donald and Betty and, and, and the two of us were traveling from the Canadian branch AGM in Kingston, Ontario, all the way via Toronto and uh, Niagara, um, Pennsylvania, right down to the US AGM seven days later in Savannah in Georgia. And we stopped off on way at Washington DC and met up with Rod and um, Tokyo Bill. Um, that's Bill McPherson of the Klan Association. And we were given a tour of the museum, but unf unfortunately we didn't know about the harmonica at that time, so we didn't see it. So if we ever go back, we'll make a point of visiting it. So that's that, that's the, the little lady. Okay, Jim, thank you. Sorry, um, before that one. Just to finish um, uh, this one, the, the little lady's got eight notes, so it's got a full octave. So you're limited as to what you can actually play. Um, on it to an octave, but you can get certain tunes. in your mouth and be careful not to swallow it. <laughs> now what I'm doing when I'm showing you that, I'm demonstrating that I'm actually moving my chin um, and then inside my mouth, I'm doing certain things with, uh, 
you get that, and I do that with with all the instruments, and that's how you you, you bend notes, and and you can get different tremolos, particularly um, as, as sounds on the tremolo organ. Okay, Jim, we can move on. I'm not going to move on to. No, sorry, I, I, I've missed something. Missed something. I, if, if you can give me a blank screen, just myself. I've forgotten I've got something else. I've got a special treat for you. I've got a guest coming. Um, and I'm going to play the first tune in the key of D. And for the second tune, I've got a guest appearing. I'm hoping that she's going to turn up soon. But, but I'm going to play this. This is some music by... I didn't want to leave the ladies out. And I'm going to demonstrate a couple of ladies playing for you. One was my current Nancy Aston. If you don't know Nancy Aston, she, she was actually um, an American lady. Um, but she became the first British member of lady, female member of parliament in Britain. Um, strange in some ways, has strange, some strange views in my opinion. Um, but anyway, she used to entertain the great and the good, such as Winston Churchill to Clevedon. Um, her husband was Waldorf Aston, and he became Viscount, and he had to give up his seat in, in Plymouth Sutton. And Nancy Aston was elected the first female MP. That was in 1919. But she used to entertain the, the good at Clevedon, their, their stately home including Winston Churchill, and, and she used to play uh, this particular tune for, um, for Winston. I call him Winston now, you see. I, I used to look after him on occasions, and um, I would never dream of calling him Winston in these days. <laughs> anyway, here we are. And then this is in the key of D. <laughs> So that's um, Camptown Races, which, which I understand it was in Pennsylvania, but not, um, not, not in Britain at all. So the next one I'm going to play, but uh, and I'm hoping that you can try and guess who it is. And, and after, a, after a few notes, she'll make an appearance. But try and guess. And this, oh yes, here we are. I'm going to play... Um, an African-American spiritual song, and it will be in the key of G. Compiled by John Wesley Wark, W-O-R-K, Jr., dating back to at least 1865, that has been sung and recorded by many gospel and secular performers, including Peter, Paul, and Mary in 1963. It's not Peter, Paul, or Mary that's going to make a guest appearance. It is considered... A Christmas carol because its original lyrics celebrate the nativity of Jesus. <laughs> I couldn't see. Yeah. Thumbs up. Yeah. 
Thank you very much indeed for coming. You, you can go home now. Thank you. And I've sent her off now. And now we'll move on to, to, to the next one, Jim, please. Now, I'm going, this good looking chap here is, it is, um, is someone called um, Ignatz Topolino. And uh, quite a few of you have seen me uh, play the, the I, I call it a nose flute, but it's not a real nose flute. And uh, there, there is such a thing as a nose flute. And that's um, a popular instrument in some Polynesian countries such as Fiji and Tonga and also Hawaii, New Zealand and certain African countries such as Congo. Various versions, but it's basically shaped like a flute and played with the nose either with one or both nostrils. Okay, so that's that's a real nose flute. This is my nose flute, which is which is the same as my mouth organ. And anyone's quite happy to try it after me. Um, it's always important before you play the mouth or the muthi is that you rinse your mouth out. But it's equally important that when you play it by nose that you blow your snout. And I'll explain why. <laughs> now, in the annals of nose harmonica players, Ignaz Topolino was one of the very best. Ignaz, I think, is German for Ignatius. But with a name like Topolino, there's a certain amount of Italian in there. I think Topolino is a, a comic, a, a type of comic in Italy. Um, and I haven't found it, despite considerable research, who he was. But he must have survived or lived around about the 1940s and 50s. And he was described as a genius. Grown men would weep at his rendition of whatever Lola wants. And women would toss their panties whenever he played his heartbreaking version of Summertime. But like all geniuses, Topolina had his obsessions. He is perhaps best known for his obsessive dedication to nasal hygiene. And you can, that's a quite a nice picture of him. And he would often try new products intended to freshen his olfactory organ. Nothing was satisfactory. He poured much of his fortune into looking for devices that would keep his muzzle clear of mucus. Having a mucus clear muzzle is extremely important when you're playing by nose. And even hired a research team to look after, to look for more aggressive technology. Eventually, they came across some of the later work of the Victorian inventor in the 1850s, Michael Flanagan. Born in Ireland and moved to London, he had a busy life with inventions, including helping families suffering due to prostitution. One of his many inventions was a working prototype. And that's where this is, Flanagan's pump action nasal cavity irrigation system. So that's the nasal cavity irrigation system, circa 1901. And this top, Topolino experimented with. The system comprised of a container, container for holding liquid, something like the five liter weed killer container that I use today. Two hoses were connected to the top which were held by the individual who positioned their ends in the nostrils openings. The operator of the device, and a, a bow tie incidentally, apparently is not mandatory. He waited until the individual was ready, at which point the operator would shout, prepare for injection, giving the person one last chance to remove the hoses. The operator then vigorously depressed and raised the mega plunger providing the delightful pump action necessary to help the person eliminate potentially embarrassing nasal discharge. As a cleanser, Topolina discovered the delightful pump action was more powerful than necessary and the carbolic acid used in cleansing solution also did not help. His nose harmonica career was essentially over and Topolina would have been forgotten to the world if not for his later heartbreaking autobiography, A Nose by Any Other Name. Ignatz was somewhat eccentric. 
On his first visit to London, London, he was late for an appearance at the Royal Albert Hall and explained that when he entered the underground station, he was confused by a sign that said, dogs must be carried, adding, it took me an hour and a half to find one. So there we are. That's, that's the end of the story of Ignatz Topolino, quite a character. And I would like to thank, um, and I forget his name, the chap who um, composed this story online, where I have borrowed it for, from for this occasion. And now I'll play a tune, and I hope it competes with Ignatz. Should I say that there are a few, I don't know how many people actually play, play the, the Muthi with their nose, but um, most either cover one nostril, it seem to play almost with a right nostril, which I do. Oh, that sounds good. All right now. Right nostril, and they either cover it with a finger or stick a cotton wool bud up the nasal passage. Um, I'm fortunate I don't have to, because when I got these teeth bashed, that was with a sort of heavy duty tor <laughs> torch back in 1964 knocking the tooth out and and um it, it did and walloped in the side of the face it did something to my nose and if you look closely i'll take my specs off i can i can actually i don't get much breath through this nostril i can actually block it off are you able to see that yeah no that's good And it's very handy because I don't have to stick any cotton wool or put my finger on here. Um, and I have to take my specs off. Um, well, no, I don't really have to because I can play with the smaller one. I have to put them on to find it. There it is. <laughs> I'm going to play um, the Rowan tree. And this is in the key of G. And, uh, and it's best for me to start by mouth. And you get the tremolo sound with, with it that way. Moving on to something else, um, if we can just have a blank screen, um, thanks, um, Jim. I promised to do something completely different that never been done in Scotland. There's meant to be a bit of a bit of a surprise. It, to, to, to the best of my knowledge, it's never been done in Scotland. So I'll read this little bit out now. That'll give you a clue about it, and it. It, this chap is Indian. Um, his name is Rajiv Kumar. And this, it's a story about young Rajiv. The young Indian musician plays the harmonica mouth organ through his nose. He even can play two harmonicas at once, using his nose and his mouth. The young virtuoso has been delighting Indian television audiences with his unusual talent. His repertoire ranges from Debussy to old Hindi songs. Hindi songs. Rajiv did not acquire his squil, uh, skills overnight. He spends an hour a day practicing yoga steps 
and breathing to strengthen his nasal, nasal power. Before every perform performance, he puts two nasal drops in his right nostril to clear the airwaves, and a lubricant is applied to the end of his nostril to help it stay open. While playing the harmonica with his nose, he blocks his left nostril with a tiny cotton ball, using only his right nostril to play the instrument. It requires three times more power and strength when I play the instrument through my nose, but it requires even more power when I play too, using both my mouth and nose. He says that it took him fully six months to blow out a single note of a song through my nose. It was very tough, but I did it. What a stalwart. It was tough, but I did it. I got scratches and swellings in my nose, but I never lost heart. Mr. Puma says the strain is clear. When he plays the instrument, the veins run running through his nose and neck bulge. His eyes pop out and his face looks red and his nose and his neck bulges. Sorry, and his face looks red and stretched. He says that it requires a lot of stamina, but playing the harmonic Kind of simultaneously through his nose and mouth is his obsession. So there we are. I'm, I'm now going to give it a try. Um, I, I can confirm it takes a, fa a fair bit of fair, fair bit of uh, fair bit of power to to um, to do it. So I'm going to start off with the mouth again. I'll have to take my specs off this time. I'll just make sure I'm in the key of G. Okay. <laughs> and now we come to the final, we come to the Kelly. And I can see Lachlan coming in now. <laughs> um, um this will be in the key of the key of G. It's I like to think of it as a Canadian song. So our Canadian um, band members that are present will be pleased. But are you able to see that? Um, it's, a, it's a story of the Red River Valley. And it's a folk song in cowboy music. And there's obviously a lot of Scottishness in it because they were heavily involved at that time. And that is, it's gone by different names depending on where it has been sung. Members of the Western Writers of America chose it as number 10 of the 10 100 Western songs of all time. There is anecdotal evidence that the song was known in at least five Canadian provinces before 1896. This finding led to spe speculation that the song was composed at the time of the 1870 um, Woolsey expedition, expedition to Manitoba's northern Red River Valley. The Red River runs through Minnesota, south in, in the US, north of US, and North Dakota into Manitoba in Canada. Obviously just next to Ontario and Mont Montreal. It expresses the real sorrow of a local woman, possibly a metis, as her soldier lover prepares to return 
to the east. So it, it quite possibly is a, a person of, of uh, local origin and, um, and a Scot or a Brit at least um, who was there. Um, the, the earliest known written transcript of the lyrics titled The Red River Valley was in the 1870s and over the years it's been recorded by many singers including Gene Autry and also used in numerous films including The Red River Valley. And I showed that, I showed the book because that tells a story, it's a novel based on historic facts and real life characters and, and the individual in this story is Kate McPherson who settled in, in that land um, by the Red River. And I, I particularly mention the late J. Donald McPherson, who was chairman of the Canadian branch and also chairman of the, the International Association at one time. His family migrated across to that area at the time of the clearances in Sutherland. That's where they left from, originally from, uh, from Erinoch, moved to Sutherland and then were cleared out around about 1910. And this is the story of Kate McPherson from Kildonan in Sutherland. And Kildonan is where Jay Donald's people left around about the same time. And Jay Donald was a sixth generation Canadian at that time. And Jay Donald was a, was a great friend and we stayed with him in Canada. And as I said, we traveled all the way down to Savannah. A, a lovely couple. Anyway, I'll, I'll play the tune now, and, and if Jim would kindly put the words up, and I'm hoping we can all sing together. Is it okay if we all unmute, Jim, for the song? Everyone unmute. This should be interesting. Um, I'll play the tune through first so that everybody's got it. One, two, three, four, five. If Jim can put his thumb up, just to remind me when I'm reached, reaching the last verse, but... Um, Having it in front of me does help, and anyway, I'll play it through. Play it through once. Oh, <laughs> 
Well done. And perfect harmony. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jim. That's, uh, that, 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 if you can take the watch down, Jim. Thank you. Am I on screen now? Yeah. No. Well, thank you. I thought you were all in perfect harmony there. <laughs> Um, so that, that that's the end the end of it. I think that's I've covered the um, the components and and the history of the instrument and and played a, f a few tunes with stories. So I hope hope you've enjoyed it. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Ian. That was an absolute tour de force of, of extraordinary harmonic musicianship. Uh, great stuff. What a wonderful uh, way to kick off a Saturday evening. <laughs> um, we've got a wee bit of time for some questions. Does anyone have any questions that they'd li like to ask you in? What, 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 what? Has what? Iris got a hand up? Has Denise... Yeah. Denise. Denise, go for it. Oh, I'm, I'm thinking of the harmonica in relation to the piano. Do you have, is one end that you start at or is it like, is there a, a, a starting point and an ending point when you're trying to find your notes on the scale or can you, I'm just trying to figure out how you know which, what, which, tunnel to blow through to the achieve the note that you're trying to get but yes it's um the, 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 the one i play the tremolo they're, they're each uh, they're in the key of c or g or b right. or a or d um and so you you you'll find your you find your key for that <laughs> There's a scale, right? Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, si, do. Yeah. So if, 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 you, if you know a bit about music, you can now learn it on online because I couldn't as a boy. Okay. Um, but yes, it's got. In my case, the different keys are there, so you just find the key, and the rest of the notes follow on from that. And once you've got your, once you've got your chromatic scale. And it is a chromatic scale because if it's in the key of G, then it's got an F sharp. Mm -hmm. Is um, there anything on the on the part of the harmonica that faces you that indicates, say, where like a C, the middle C is? No, no, there isn't. Just at the end of it, it tells me what key it's in. It, it's stamped on, stamped on the end of it. Oh. I actually put it in white paper so I can read it. <laughs> <laughs> I can pick it up if I have difficulty because it, the light shines and it's difficult to see it. But no. Thank you. Okay. Fabulous. And I think we've got a question from Alistair. You have your hand up if you'd like to ask you. Yeah, uh, thank you. It's not a question, actually, just a comment. It's Uncle you. I think Elaine and I, my young sister Jane's joined us now as well. We're well, unaware you're so talented, Uncle you. You know that when I. Look at all the talent you had there, fantastic. So well done. Excellent. <laughs> really made our night. I think I, I think Alice might be interested in, in, in how I I learned to play the instrument. Yeah, yeah. tell us about more. Um, it, it goes back a long time. I was doing having uh, piano lessons and then I had piano accordion lessons, but it, it was before the piano accordion. I actually found the piano accordion very difficult because from playing it horizontally and moving the keys on one hand and buttons on the other, and the key of C on the piano accordion is, is indented. That's how you find your key on a piano accordion. I find very difficult. But anyway, going back to the the the, 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 the how, how I first learned it, I, I, 
was having music lessons. I would have only been about 10 years old at the time, so at least I knew my scales and things like that. Um, and one day I was going th through my mother's dressing table drawer and I, I found a mouth organ. And I can't remember now whether it was a tremolo. I think it was. And it belonged to my uncle Walter, her, her br youngest brother. And he had been called up during the war. And, and he, they lived in Tainalt in Argyll. And he was c called up into the Sherwood Foresters in Nottingham, which was a long way away. And that, it was understandable because in World War I, they had family regiments and, and regiments were involved in battles. The whole family could be lost, so they spread them around. And I think that's why he turned up in Nottingham. But anyway, he, he must have stayed with them. He a single young boy at the time, so he was the youngest. And he'd left his harmonica behind and his Jewish harp. This isn't it, Jews or Jaws harp. Um, and I, I picked it up and I, took, I remember taking it up to the woods and playing it. And, and I hadn't got a clue. But then I realised when I started to, to play it that, that you had a scale. So I picked it up from there. So I've got Uncle Walter to, to thank for, for teaching me that, oh. that um, the, the story about how uh, I first learned the harmonica and then I carried on playing it off and on after that. Incidentally, Uncle Walter was, was an inter interesting chap. He, the the um, Olympic Games were in Berlin in 1936 and they had some children's games before that. And he went out and took, took part in the games, you see. And he was running up and down and doing press-ups and things. And one of the one of the guys came up to him, one of the, uh, what do you call it, um, people in charge, and, and said to him, are you a Paul Walter? And he said, no. He said, I'm a Scottish, but tell me, how did you know my name was Walter? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a side, a side, a side, a side track. Any other questions, please? Fabulous, thank you. I think uh, Douglas, you've got your hand up. We'd like to ask you a question. Where's Douglas? I haven't seen him yet. Hello, Ian. Hi. Wonderful <laughs> performance. <laughs> you and you've inspired us, and I would like to try to follow your noble art, but. Can I ask, do you recommend that I trim my nose hair before I start? <laughs> um, I must admit, I can't think of anybody offhand that plays it with with with, um, with facial hair. But thinking <laughs> back, I, I think thinking back, I used to have a moustache between 1974 and uh, and um, 74 and 88, 14 years, and I used to play it so. It's worth a try. <laughs> yeah, so I manage them, and, and your 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 mouse is quite short, so you, you'll probably get, you'll you'll probably get away with it. It's not a big bushy one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my mouth! I'm sorry. For a moment, I thought you said my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for your question, Douglas. We've got a couple of questions in in the chat. Um, so Maria's asked, does anyone else in your family play, Ewan? Um, well, <laughs> Uncle Walter did. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Not not to my knowledge. So the, 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 I, I was imagining fat family Christmases where you're all sitting around p p playing <laughs> beautiful Christmas carols, but clearly not. That's uh, <laughs> you, you, you're the lone lone player in the family. That's that, that's great. Um, then we got uh, a question from Alan in the chat, uh, uh, which is a slightly more uh, precise musical question. Uh, do you tongue block with the tremolo harmonica or pucker? Yes, the, the simple answer is yes. You you, you use it a lot. And if you look at it, and you go like that. Oh. I don't 
as a solid block it um, completely, but uh, otherwise you wouldn't get any music. But you certainly pucker very much with it, but, but you can't see it, and your chin's going, and that but that's hidden part of the time. <laughs> Fabulous, fantastic, thank you very much Ian. Um, any final questions for you Ian, before we head off to enjoy the rest of the evening? No, is that, can I just ask a question, is that Stuart from South Africa I see? Yes, Stuart from South Africa is here. So we've got a really international audience, isn't that fantastic? <laughs> it's gone worldwide. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Your skills are known throughout the globe now, Ewan. <laughs> Worldwide fame awaits. <laughs> Excellent. Well, 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 we'll wrap things up there. Um, well, while you were um, talking and playing, Ewan, um, it reminded me that we have our own harmonica, a uh, Hona, uh, lurking Ooh. in our pile of, of unplayed instruments, and, and you've inspired me to have a go, uh, along with yeah, the, the, the chanter that lies unplayed here as well. So maybe it's a, a musical winter ahead inspired by your wonderful playing this evening. So thank you very much, Ewan. And thank you, everyone else, to, for, for coming along now for some splendid questions. Um, it just remains to, to thank you in once again for a wonderful evening and to say goodbye to Ron. So thank you and bye for now. <laughs>